Hey, Redeemer, if you have your Bibles, I uh, invite you to turn them to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 16. As you make your way there, uh, we finished up uh, last week in the book of Ruth, and the book of Ruth ended with this genealogy that takes us uh, to David, through Obed, to Jesse, to David. And in your English Bibles, the very next book after uh, Ruth is 1 Samuel. And the first time we see David in 1 Samuel is what we're about to read this morning. And so Ruth's gospel really, is, Ruth's book really is a bridge into uh, the kingship of David. And we're going to read this morning about him. 1 Samuel 16, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of this, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded, and he came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There is... There, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. And from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and the harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who were before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit of God is upon you, he will play it, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. And one of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David to his son Saul. By David his son to Saul, and David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit of God was upon Saul, David took the lyre, and he played it with his hand. And Saul was refreshed and was well. The harmful spirit departed from him. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, your word is sufficient even as it is read, merely read before your people. Our minds begin to be curious, your spirit begins to work, and you work in us just by reading. Your word is powerful, it is active, and it is sharp. 
And then you've been pleased, Lord, to give to your people uh, servants who are rightly divided. And Father, I pray that, that you will help me to rightly divide your word. It will bring you glory and honor. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would work in me, but also in our midst. Make us sound hearers of your word. Make us true believers of your word. And make us joyful doers of your word. Do this that your name might be praised and your word might accomplish the purpose for which you send it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, Advent is upon us, and uh, this is the time of year where the church historically has uh, paused to think deeply about the first coming of Jesus, but to also about his final coming. And we all have calendars. We have calendars for appointments, calendars when our kids need to be picked up from school, calendars when we need a doctor's appointment. We're used to calendars and uh, the church for ages has uh, tried to have a calendar that helps us to rightly orient our lives. Second Peter chapter 3 tells us that the saints, in light of the coming day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, that we ought to wait and we ought to long for it. And the way that we wait and long for it is through godliness and holiness. And so it's right for us to enter into a season where we want to have affections properly oriented uh, around what it means to have a king who's come, but a king who is also coming. John Calvin, picking up on an earlier church father, uh, really added some weight and some gravity uh, to our threefold understanding of Jesus. That you just read it in our larger catechism that Jesus Christ is our mediator, but he is our mediator occupying three different offices. And the first office is that Jesus is the ultimate prophet. What does that mean? That means that if you look at the scriptures, the Lord raised up prophet after prophet after prophet and their task was to say, thus says the Lord. Well, Jesus comes as the final prophet. There's no one wiser. There is no one coming after him with new revelation. That they spoke, thus says the Lord. Jesus would come and say, well, I say to you, saying that he is the ultimate prophet. And that's what the author of Hebrews would say, that long ago, in many times, in many ways, God spoke to us by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. Jesus is the par excellence teacher. Calvin also said that Jesus is the uh, par excellence priest. And if you read the Old Testament, it's hard not to see sacrifices and priests and atonement and mediators, that they are a part of the economy of God. And what we're, we're saying is that Jesus stands in line with them. There is no other priest. He has made the once and for all sacrifice to atone for our guilt and our sin. And it's not the blood of goats and bulls that the one who is the ultimate priest offered the ultimate sacrifice. And that's himself. And Jesus is also the king. That you'll read the Old Testament and you'll read 1 Samuel. Israel wanted a king You'll read 2 Samuel. It's going to be about kings. You'll read 1 Kings and 2 Kings. You'll read the Old Testament, and you're, you will be hard-pressed to, to not see this kingship, um, this need for a king kind of lift, being lifted off of Scripture. And what Jesus is, is the final king. And when you look at the life of David, David is Israel's watermark king. And yet, as we'll look at here shortly, Ezekiel says a day is coming when a greater David will come. And he will take his sheep and he will be shepherd and king over them. And so there's a comparison being made between the life of David and the coming of David's Lord and David's son. And it's Christ. It's the reason Jesus' genealogy tracks straight through David's line. There's a connection being made. And because of that, we can look at the life of David and see beyond it. We can see into the life of Christ. 
We can look at the situations that David are in and, and what he brings to bear upon the people of God, and we can infer that if David did this in that measure, there must be a greater king coming who will do it perfectly and without fault. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at passages about David or written by David during this Advent, and we're going to drill down into not the prophet, not the priest, but what Advent means for us to have a king. And so what I want us to cover today is our need for a king. We're going to look at God's gift of a king. And then we'll look at the heart and work of this king. The need for a king, God's gift of a king, and the heart and work of this king. Now, the need for a king. As we look at our passage, there's a lot going on. If we were to step back and say, what's happening in the collective? In other words, if you were to look at the people, look at the leaders, look at the prophet, and even look at King Saul, I think we can deduce what's happening in the collective people of God. Now, I think that's a fair question. I think it's a question that we could also ask ourselves today, here and now. What's going on, like, in our world or in our city? or in your home, or in our church? What's the collective? What are some collective emotions that we feel right this moment as Advent comes? Some have said divided. You look at the presidential election, divided. We're in the middle of a pandemic, and there's a divided sense of how we move forward. Some want to wear masks, some don't. Some want to socially distance, some don't. Some think herd immunity will make it better. Some are waiting on a vaccine. I mean, we are kind of divided, like, oh, even over things like that. And what's happening in the church? I think members, by and large, are panicked, somewhat afraid, possibly frustrated that we sense our own vulnerability as people we know have gone to be with the Lord. And if we're honest, we kind of wonder, will the house of mourning visit our house? And will, will we be the one being mourned over? Or will we be the one mourning over loss? But what about with leaders? i give you some facts. Last month in Nashville, four pastors quit at their presbytery meeting. It's like, we're done. We, we can't do it. It's hard. PCA, RBI, that's the retirement and benefits arm of our denomination. They normally spend $7,000 a year to come alongside of pastors to help cover counseling. You want to know what they spent? As of November the 16th, $90,000 this year. I have friends who pastor all black missionary Baptist churches. I was on the phone with one last night. Friends who are in multi-ethnic churches throughout this entire denomination. Was praying with a group of white pastors in our city, in our denomination two weeks ago. And pastors are tired, uncertain, anxious, weary. I think if you were to step back and were to be honest about where we are, maybe where you are, or where you've been, that this Advent season finds us anxious, it finds us frail, it finds us afraid, and it finds us vulnerable. And that's exactly what's going on in our passage. Did you notice what Samuel said, what the Lord had to say to Samuel when this passage opens up? The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? 
If you go back to 1 Samuel 15, and Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night long. And so all of a sudden, lament. Like, there is a national lament going on in 1 Samuel 16. On top of the lament, did you notice what what, what Samuel said to the Lord right down there in verse 2? Okay, Lord, if I go, if Saul hears of this, he will kill me. So not only is there lament, there is also fear, fear that this guy might take me out. And guess what? The fear does not just terminate with the prophet. This is the prophet. Did you notice how the people, the men, the elders of Bethlehem felt when they saw Samuel coming? Now, remember, keep Ruth in your background. We are going to the same city, Bethlehem. Probably the same gate where Boaz redeemed Ruth. And now all of a sudden, these elders, a different crop of elders, see Samuel the prophet coming. Look at the first thing out of their mouths. The elders in verse 4, they came to meet him and they were trembling. Do you come peaceably? And he says, I come peaceably. And it doesn't just stop with the elders. And if you go back a few chapters in 1 Samuel, you'll see that, that there is fear in the hearts of the people. So much fear that when they were fighting, the, the Bible actually says they ran and hid themselves in the tombs. That's a ceremonial no-no for Israel. You don't go hide yourself in tombs where dead bodies were to protect your life from enemies. You are becoming ceremonially unclean, but that's how afraid they were that they would be willing to run and hide in a tomb than to go be killed. And it's even in Saul. If you go back a few chapters and remember when Saul was set apart to be king, do you know where he was? He was hiding in the luggage. The king, your king, is hiding? That is what's going on in 1 Samuel. Sure, he has a few victories. Sure, he does a few things right. But the national collective emotional toll that his reign is having upon the people moves them to fear and panic and anxiety and frustration and vulnerability. And maybe that is where you are this Advent. You're vulnerable and you feel weak and you feel anxious and you feel nervous and you feel frustrated. What would happen if we listened to what our heart is saying to us? You know what it's telling you? You are frail. And you are weak. And you are vulnerable. You just didn't see it. And if we listen even further, you know what it's going to tell us? We need a king. We need someone to rule over us who will right our wrongs. We need someone to rule over us who will turn our gloom into gladness. We need someone to rule over us who can turn our mourning into dancing, our grief into gratitude, our fear into faith, our sadness in serenity, our gloom into gladness. We are like sheep. And we need a good king who is a shepherd. That's the backdrop to 1 Samuel. Now, here's what God does, that there's a need, that they're sheepish, they're vulnerable, they're panicky, they're frustrated, they're they're, they're at risk. And it's against this backdrop that God says, I will give you someone. And so we move into this gift, this beautiful gift of God to them. He gives them a soft-hearted, spirit-empowered shepherd king. That's his gift to him. 
In 1 Samuel 12, the Lord tells them, do not be afraid. But why can the Lord tell them not to be afraid? Because he says, for the Lord will not forsake you. He will not forsake his great name because it has pleased him to make you a people for himself. And here's what you see God doing in 1 Samuel 16. It's him getting to work. It's him giving instruction. It's him giving direction. It's him basically telling Israel this. Hey, go back and read Ruth. Because way back here in Ruth, before the events happened in 1 Samuel 16, I already had a king that I was creating. And so when you looked up one day and felt your vulnerability, guess what? I've been working on a king. Matter of fact, he's already ready. I'm going to tell you where to go and get him. So it's not like God is reacting to their need. It's a big God who already knew that you would find a need for a king one day. And when you realize you need a king from me and not from you, guess what? I don't have to start my plan. I already got my plan. And so that's what the Lord does. He tells Samuel, stop grieving Fill your horn with oil because today you're anointing somebody. And the one you anoint this time is the king that I will send them and not the king they want. And so he tells Samuel to go. And Samuel's afraid. How can I go? I'll be killed. The Lord says, hey, I I got Saul. Matter of fact, take a heifer and tell him you're going to sacrifice. You do that. And you anoint the one that I tell you to. And notice verse four, which I think is really important. And Samuel did what the Lord commanded him. Why is that so important? Because if you look at the previous chapter, do you want to know why Saul was outed as a king? Because he didn't do what the Lord told him to do. The Lord says, when you go and seize this people, devote it all to destruction, destroy the king and everything else. And then Samuel comes up and Samuel hears sheep. (laughs) And Samuel's like, whoa, why do I hear something? Well, I kind of didn't do it all. And then notice what Samuel says right there in the previous chapter in verse 22. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying his voice? Behold, to obey is better than a sacrifice and to listen to him is better than the fat of rams. And so here is what you see. Samuel, is he rebuked Saul in the previous chapter because he would not obey. And now you get in the very next chapter, God tells Samuel to go make a sacrifice. I got you. It's going to be good. And Samuel, still grieving, still lamenting, still afraid, it's better to obey than it is to not. And so I will do. And so Samuel does. He takes a dose of his own medicine. And then he gets there. And Eliab comes up and surely he thought, this is him. And the Lord says, no, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then Jesse called his next son, Abinadab, and made him pass before Samuel. And then he made his next son, Shema, pass before Samuel. And he made seven sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel's like, okay, it got to be him. 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 Man, is this it? He's prone to look at physical stature or strength or might. And the Lord says, no, my king, we're starting from the inside out. His heart, that's what I want, a soft-hearted king. And the one who is soft-hearted is the one that they forgot about. Samuel says, are all your sons here? In verse 11, he says, there remains yet the youngest, and the youngest could also be translated the smallest, and I think the smallest is the better translation because a contrast is being set up between Saul, who was the tallest, and David is the smallest. And he says, go get him and bring him here. And he brought him there. 
And it says he was ruddy, probably red-headed. He was beautiful-eyed, and he was handsome. And there are three things here that are important about this king that God gives. The first is he's a shepherd king. Now, in chapter 16 and 17, three different times, it is said of David that he is with the sheep. So did you notice when he was overlooked, wh- wh- where's his other son? Oh, he's the son tending to the sheep. Surely you don't want that one. Yeah, that, that's the one I want right there. Bring him. And then you see it in, the, in, in, in verse 18. Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war. A man of valor is the same language used to describe Boaz and Ruth. He's a worthy man, a man of valor. And so now you see that this quality is also in David. And it, but notice what it says, a man of war, prudent in speech, a man of good presence, The Lord is with him. And therefore Saul sent the messengers to Jesse and said, send me David, your son. Where is he? Who is with the sheep? You see it in verse 17, when they are fighting the Philistines. And it says that Saul has sent David and David goes back and forth between the war and between feeding the sheep. Three times. In two chapters, this king that God is sending them is a shepherd. At his core, he's a shepherd. That he takes delight in caring for the vulnerable. That his life's mission is to protect and to provide and to nourish and to lead. That that's the heart that God wants. But we're also told that he is a a man empowered by the spirit. The presence of God is with him in verse 13. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. When in verse 18, David is described as a man of good presence and the Lord is with him. So not only is he a shepherd king, but he's a shepherd king who is spirit empowered. And he's also soft hearted. The deepest thoughts and the emotions and intentions of his being. Is bent around love for God. And love for God's word. That he wants to obey. He takes delight in obedience. He wants to worship. He wants to render his life back unto the Lord's. And this is tailor-made for the people. They need a shepherd king. They need a soft-hearted king. They need a king empowered by the Spirit. And that is exactly who God gives them. David is an example. What if I told you that that someone greater than David has come? That if you were to turn over to Ezekiel 37, it reads as this. My servant David shall be king over them and they will have one shepherd. Ezekiel 34, and I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God. Ezekiel 34, verse 31, you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture, and I am your God. In other words, Ezekiel, which is written 500 years after this, and 500 years after Before Jesus comes, do you know what the prophet Ezekiel says? I'm raising up somebody and he's going to be like David, but better. And you're still going to be like sheep. They were sheep in 1 Samuel 16 and you're going to be sheepish right here and now. But it's okay. I got a king I'm raising up. He's going to be of David. He will be a king over them and he will be their shepherd. And you know his name. His name is Jesus. And that's the reason when Jesus was 
anointed. He says, the spirit of God has anointed me. Samuel didn't anoint me with no oil. The spirit of God has anointed me. When he was baptized, the spirit of God descended upon this king like a dove and God was with him and in him. He is God. And it's the reason in Matthew chapter nine, when Jesus was walking around, the people were saying, son of David, have mercy on us. It's the reason in Matthew chapter nine, Jesus looks at his people. He says they are being harassed. And they are like sheep without a shepherd. And I'm the shepherd. I'm the good king. I'm the one that Ezekiel prophesied over. I'm the one coming after David. It's me. The soft-hearted, spirit-empowered shepherd king is Jesus. He is God's gift God's ultimate gift to his people. It's him. And bound up in him is power and might and tenderness. Bound up in him is a heart that comes to do God's will. Bound up in him is authority and dominion. We don't need a king. We're not looking for a king. The Bible says you have one. Do you see him? Do you believe that? That right now your king is on a throne. And right now he reigns. And he rules. And I know it's hard to see him. But by faith. He is there. And he is real and he rules and he works and he moves and he acts in the here and now. Advent calls us to remember this and to ponder this. Which moves us into our last point. What's the heart and the work of this king? We'll see it in David first. Did you notice every time something important is happening, David is over here with the sheep. (laughs) Like Samuel comes to do the anointing to choose the king and everybody in the family are gathered. All the elders of the city are there and David seems to be the odd man out. He's like, wait a minute, this can't be it. It got to be another one. Oh, yeah, he's over there. Did you remember where David was when Saul summoned him? When Saul's servant hears that there's this kid or this young man who plays the leer or the liar who is skilled and the Lord is with him. Where is he? I saw him in the shepherd. I saw him in the field. And Saul says, go get him. Your your son, Jesse, the one who's out there with the sheep. And did you notice in chapter 17, when the battle is going on, that David is running back and forth between feeding his father's sheep and then going over here to the battle? What are we being told? That for this king, his sheep are his sure priority. You got to remember that. That for David, he's going to be a lot of stuff. But one thing that is a sure priority of David in 1 Samuel 16 and 17 is his sheep. He can't leave them. He can't part with them. He can't wake up and not think about his obligations to them. And that's the first thing we learn about the heart and work of this shepherd king is that his sheep are his sure priority. The second thing we see about the heart and work of this king is that his, he, he offers a stabilizing presence. Did you notice what happened to Saul? That an evil spirit sent from the Lord tormented him. And someone says, go summon somebody. Somebody got to do something about it. I saw this man. He's a man of valor a man of integrity, a man of war, and he's a shepherd, and he plays this instrument, and he worships. Saul says, go get him. 
And whenever David came around and played, he soothed Saul's soul. And Saul is his enemy. Saul is going to want him dead. Saul is going to chase him down. And what you see in David is his presence is soothing. When he is around, all is well with his soul. And this king offers superb protection. In the next chapter, you'll see when David and Saul are interacting. And David is saying that Saul is afraid of Goliath. And David says, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from my flock, I went after him and I struck him and I delivered him out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and I struck him and I killed him. Your servant struck down both lions, plural, and bears, plural. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver Deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. You hear what David just said? He didn't have no gun. No harpoon. No rifle with sights on it. We are talking about a shepherd who, if we believe in the truthfulness of Scripture, which I do, he's not lying. This is not metaphor. This is not a poem. This is not make-believe. He's actually saying, hey, I'm going to take that giant out because God's going to help me. Just like I have rescued my sheep from the mouths of lions and bears. You know what Samuel is telling us? This king is going to offer superb protection for his sheep. He will not let them be devoured. He will rescue them. He will risk his life to bring them back and to give them safety. You know where I'm going with it already. Do you believe that this is Jesus' ministry to you? You see, the reason I had Steve read from our larger catechism is because the larger catechism tells us this, that Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. But notice what it says. He is prophet, priest, and king, both in his states of humiliation and in his states of exaltation. What does that mean? It means that when Jesus humbled himself and took on flesh and came to the earth, he was the good shepherd. He was the king. He was God's anointed. And when he came to earth, he did protect. He did heal. He did rescue. And he did all of this culminating in the cross. But here's the mistake that I think we all make. And me on my worst day, I forget. I forget that my king is still my king in his state of exaltation. And that means that right now, he's on the throne. And it means that right now, the same Jesus' voice you heard that brought you from darkness to light is the same voice that you can hear to restore joy to your soul. Do you know what it's like to be in panic and in fear and for Jesus's words to wash over you? Fear not what can kill your body. Don't fear that. You respect it, but you don't fear it. You fear me. Do you know what it's like to hear Jesus say, he who lives and dies in me will never ever die again. You don't have to be afraid of death. You'll live forever. It's a win-win always for God's people. Do you know what it's like to hear the soothing voice of the king who says, do not be anxious about your life or what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear? He says, look at the birds of the heavens. Look at the lilies of the field. You are far more precious to the Father than that. And if God clothes and feeds, do you think that he will abandon you? 
Our king is on a throne right now. And he wakes up, and every day you're on his mind. You're his priority. He has worlds to rule and galaxies to rule and beautiful things to create and things to sustain and still feed and clothe the earth. But on his list of priorities, you can put your name. He's a shepherd who loves his sheep, who's laid down his life for his sheep. You are one of his priorities. And he offers you and I a stabilizing presence. Do you know what it's like to read God's word and to watch the Holy Spirit soothe your anxious, fearful heart? He still does that. That's not haphazard. That's your king at work. Do you know what it's like to know that you are superbly protected? You have that. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus if Jesus is your king. It's a win-win. If you stay here, you get more fruitful life. If you die, you wake up and you're with him. You're safe. No one is greater than the Father. No one is greater than the Son. And if you're not in Christ, I want you to listen to your anxiety and your vulnerability because it's telling you something. You aren't as strong as you think you are. You are vulnerable. And you are weak. And if you perish in your weakness and your vulnerability without beholding the king that comes out of Scripture, it will be bad for your soul. Now and forever. But for those of us who know Jesus, he's beautiful and he's good. And he's present, and he's ours. That's my prayer for us this Advent season. That as we fix our eyes on our king, that we would see that he is spirit-empowered, that he is soft-hearted, that he is our shepherd king, and we are his sure priority. He offers us a stabilizing presence and he gives us superb protection let's wake up and meditate and reflect and make much of that let's pray father we thank you for your goodness to us in jesus i pray that we would not run away from our sheepishness but that we would listen to it and let it tell us what you would have it to tell us we are in need of a king And you have sent us one in your son. And we love him, adore him, worship him. And in this season, Father, we need him. Would you, by your spirit, soften our hearts that we might be receptive to his love and his presence and his ministry. I pray for those who don't know you. And do ask, Father, that you would even use our current climate to show us and show them their need. This world can give us a need, but this world cannot give us the solution. Only your word can do that. And so make Jesus beautiful to those who don't believe even now. We pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand.